actually tried to emphasize mostly things that we would agree on that are that people all agree on that are conventional um, that we do believe and that we've experimentally determined to be true. Um, so there are some things like the very early stages like cosmological inflation that hasn't been shown absolutely, but there is evidence that there was this exponential phase of expansion. We can debate the implications of that. But after that, I think the idea that there was a Big Bang expansion is very well established. The idea that there are quarks and leptons inside matter is very well established in the sense that we've made predictions that have been verified at a percent or a tenth of a percent level. Now, what could be true, and this is where things can disagree, and that's where science is interesting, is there's a notion that we have a scientist called an effective theory. The idea that if you have some scale at which you can measure things, you can make predictions about this. So for example, you could say, well, Newton's laws are not right. <coughs> After all, they break down, because they break down because quantum mechanics takes over at small scales, or because special relativity takes over at large velocities. But Newton's laws actually work very well. And you know, they can not only tell you where a ball is going to land, but we've sent rockets to the moon based on Newton's laws. But it's an effective theory in the sense that it's an approximation. It's an approximation that breaks down when you can study higher velocities or smaller distances. So where we can disagree is where the measurements haven't been made yet. But I think where the measurements have been made, we agree on what those theories I are. I disagree. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm paid to come here to disagree with you, so I have to disagree. I think that is true, but for example, the issue of dark matter is very interesting simply because it's an example in which you introduce a new form of matter to make sure that the observations match Newton's laws. It's not all that new form It's not matter. that simple. It's, okay, it's not that simple. So one thing which is important is when we disagree, it's not as if it's like two political parties. It's not as if it's two football teams or something. So in fact, I have actually worked on dark matter most of my life. Okay? So I've actually worked against dark matter as well. So there's nothing, this is really not like a football team, you know, we, we basically trying to explain the universe and there's nothing wrong with try, trying out two different things, even if they contradict each other because who knows. So I think that's an example of something in which there's data, on which there's a very successful theory, successful if you have a big assumption about something you never observed. And it could be that the theory of gravity is wrong. Of course the alternatives, particularly with respect to the, the lensing thing you mentioned, the alternatives are even worse than dark matter, and I think this is fair to say, but it could be that we haven't tried enough as theorists to find, say that all, all there is is what we see, and maybe if there is no matching between the observations and Newton's gravity without dark matter, it's because Newton's gravity is wrong. Could be, okay? So this is one example in which there's observations and we disagree, but not because we want to, to throw tomatoes at each other, like in the picture I gave you, right? but because I think it's healthy to have look at different, different explanations. But I do think it's also important, I mean, it is important to point out to the audience at least, that people have tried to find alternative theories of gravity that can explain lensing, that can explain the bullet cluster, and they're crazy. No one believes those theories. Well, I do. So there is no viable <laughs> alternative. Really no, they are crazy, and, they don't, <laughs> and, and more to the point, they don't work very well. It's also true dark matter doesn't work very well. On, the question here is that there's nothing that works very well on all scales. So if you look at, for example, galactic scales, dark matter is really painted on to, to make it work. And no one actually has made computer simulations putting the dark matter where it should be to explain everything. I think it's fair to say you would, you would need these isothermal halos, which no one has ever seen in simulations. You end up with these cuspy things, which shouldn't be there. So I think, I mean, it's, I think it's fair to say that, you know, let me just, uh, I think on galactic scales, and we can dispute this, I think, these modified gravity theories work a lot better than dark matter. And then it's true, then you go on scales like, for example, the explanation of the microwave background, the, the, how did structures form, and I agree with you that these alternatives are horrendous and they just don't work at all. And they, can, they work in a way that makes them even worse than dark matter. Because after a while they start working like dark matter, you know, it's just that. So let me just point out there's one place that we could compromise, and that's where, where my research is too, is there's a, I mean, we say the words dark matter as if it's something we know what it is. All we know, all we know about it is that it's matter. It doesn't interact with light, at least at the level we've studied it, and it acts, interacts only a little bit with itself. Now, that leaves a lot of room for different types of dark matter. And so what we don't know is 
Could it be that dark matter is more complicated, just like our universe is complicated and has different particles with different forces and different interactions, and particles of different masses? So maybe there's some interesting idea where dark matter just isn't as simple as has been commonly assumed. And that can explain some of these variations. And that's also another approach to sort of being a little bit less canonical about what's going on. Well, so I think people, um, again, people tend to just believe in what they see. And if science has taught us anything, it should be that what we see is not everything that's there, that there's a lot of things that can be there that we have never seen. Now, the thing is, we can imagine things. We can think about them mathematically or conceptually without literally seeing them, and that's what's so beautiful. We can imagine an atom, which is a quantum state with an electron around a nucleus, without, even be, without being able to go inside and actually see it. I mean, there are way, tools we have now to study atoms, to in some sense see it, but we never directly see it with our naked eye. So what about a dimension? How can we think about it? Well, I think actually probably the best analogy was this book, Flatland. I don't know how many of you have ever read this. But they said, you know, it's very hard for people who live with three dimensions of space to picture four dimensions. So let's just, let's not even try. Let's imagine that there is a world made of creatures that live in two dimensions, like they live on a tabletop. They live in a two-dimensional space. So they, to them, the third dimension, let's say up and down, is as mysterious as a fourth dimension is to us. They don't experience it. They don't see it. They don't go there. But we do, so we can understand what those two-dimensional creatures would see. So suppose, let's say, a ball, a three-dimensional ball entered their world. What would they see? They would see a series of slices, a series of disks that grew in size and then got smaller as the ball went through. So over time, they would see the entire ball, but they would never see it all at once because they can only see two dimensions. So they would see two-dimensional slices, which if in their head they could put together and say, you know what, that would add up to be a three-dimensional ball, which I can't see, but which I can imagine. And in the same way, we can see projections, we can see slices of higher dimensional worlds. We can also see evidence of higher dimensions in the form of these particles that carry momentum from another dimension. And we can work out what their properties would be so that at this particle accelerator known as the Large Hadron Collider, we might have some chance of seeing them. So again, the, the trick is not to think you have to actually visually imagine it, but you can speculate about it by thinking about these dimensions anyway. And the history, and as I said, there's no reason to believe there are only three dimensions of space. Einstein's equations work with any number of dimensions. And also, string theory, which is a theory proposed to deal with quantum mechanics and gravity, requires additional dimensions. But to my mind, one of the most interesting reasons to study it is because it has a chance to connect properties of our universe, explain things we couldn't explain otherwise, that have testable consequences. And that's why we're looking for these kluza klein modes at the Large Hadron Collider. Because, um, there's actually, again, if you think of it as not a theory of what happened at the beginning, but a theory of what happens later on, then it is proven in the sense that it's well tested. It made three very important predictions. It predicted the expansion of the universe, which has been measured. It predicted the cosmic microwave background, which has been measured. And a more subtle prediction, which I don't have time to tell you about, is the primordial creation of various heavy nuclei, which was consistent with both particle physics and with the Big Bang expansion. So if it isn't true, it would be tr not true in a very subtle way, because it has been measured to have these different influences. Um, as far as the Higgs boson goes, it's important to understand how elementary particles consistently acquire their mass. If, it, if they had masses from the get-go, you would make nonsensical predictions, like probabilities of interactions greater than one. So the Higgs, Higgs I, sh I won't say the Higgs boson, but the Higgs theory, the Higgs field, the Higgs mechanism was essential, and the Higgs boson tells us that that's right. Well, I don't think it's a force necessarily. I mean, so the idea is exactly that it is a component of the universe. But the idea is that um, the dark energy, like the dark matter, will be something that lies around we cannot see. And unlike dark matter, which is there to make gravity be stronger, dark energy makes gravity be repulsive because it's because it's just the way it is. It's basically mass with negative signs, negative mass, so to speak. So um, on the other hand, it is true that basically it could be a force. As you say, it could be a force. And, and then we go back to this whole issue. Is dark, dark matter really the answer to this extra attraction, or is it the theory of gravity? 
That's wrong. Can I expand on that just a little bit? Go ahead. So the force, according to the theory of dark, that says there's dark energy, is just gravity. It's gravity that we understand. So it's an extra contribution to what creates gravity. So gravity is a force just the same way if you have a charge, it creates an electromagnetic field. If you have mass or if you have energy, it creates a gravitational field. So really, it is a form of energy, or that's what we think. Now, which side of the equation you put it on determines whether Zhao is right and it's gravity that's modified or whether it's energy, which it, which it is, and it's just another form of energy. Okay. But this is actually relevant where you put it on one side or the other, because the problem is not so much that it's there, but why is it so small, which is yeah. what you mentioned. If you start looking at the way the dynamics works with the expansion, it should dominate, but very early on, and it doesn't. So this thing about, you know, putting, seeing it as a component of the universe or seeing it as a, as a force, as you say, could actually be relevant later on for um, answering this big puzzle, which is why is it so small. But just to add to that, I mean, people think it's a free-for-all. We have, we have this issue, clearly, like we disagree on this and that. And, but the thing is that experiment, is, science has this property. L sooner or later, experiment is going to settle the score, okay? Which is why I can work on one idea and the opposite idea, why we can disagree on things. The point is that there will be observational predictions beyond the ones we already have, and sooner or later this issue, dark matter, dark energy, blah, 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 all this stuff is going to get sorted out by further observations, and I think this is what science is. So first of all, now holograms, we're going to talk about holograms. So hologram is the opposite. Instead of having dimensions, you take dimensions away. What do you think about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it would be great to be Stephen Hawking, because then you can say whatever you want. Um, <laughs> That's an horrible thing to say. <laughs> I mean, quite seriously, I mean, we're trying to, it's just a very speculative idea. It doesn't make concrete enough predictions that we even know. I mean, so there are, I, there are reasons people think that we will eventually understand gravity as a holographic theory, but it's so speculative and it's so far from being ready, frankly, to be presented to the general public because it's not an idea that's been really worked out to the extent that we even really know what it means and that we even agree on what it is. So it's perfectly fine for people to, to speculate about crazy ideas and work out the consequences, but it isn't developed to the point that we can really say and a, that we can even intelligently discuss it with you. Except we can say big things like maybe it's a hologram, but it's very hard for us to, I mean, we couldn't even debate it. Would you agree? I'm not gonna debate that, yeah. I agree with you. So. <laughs> so what is dark energy? Well, what defines it is basically what form of energy it is in terms of how it affects gravity. That's, that's what's defining it. And what's really interesting, if you think about matter, as the universe expands, matter dilutes. So the gravitational influence of matter goes down because it's less dense. If you think about radiation, radiation dilutes. It, not only that, it redshifts, so it gets even less of it over time. So what happens early on in the universe, everything is radiation, it dominates. But as the universe evolves, radiation becomes less dense and matter takes over. Then matter is what dominates the expansion of the universe. But if you wait long enough, I mean, it's like the rabbit and the hare. I don't know if you know this tale, but it's just dark energy is just constant. It's never diluting. So even though it's this tiny amount, eventually it's going to dominate. So when we talk about dark energy, we're talking about that energy that, as far as we know, has been there for all time, but we can't see it back when it had negligible influence. So we can study it just at the time where it begins, begins to be comparable in energy to the other components of the universe that are there, namely matter. So in a way to turn this around, the, the, the issue, why, why is there so little of it? It's, if you turn this around and you said dark energy was important in the beginning of the universe, then you dominate everything forever and it would actually, you would never see the universe as we see nowadays. So, so that this doesn't happen, it must be relevant in the beginning of the universe too. So, so these two things are connected. Obviously, the, the thing is that you have to be careful not to make it very, very much, because otherwise it changes so dramatically, you'd rule out the theory. So you have to make sure it's something that happens in the early universe, um, and then only happens residually in the very late universe, because it does affect everything. So as I said, the simplest models are, as many models, the simplest ones basically have the speed of light change with the, with the color, with the frequency, but you have to make sure it only changes at very high energies, otherwise, we would not see the universe we see nowadays. The speed of light isn't changing now, or at least it's not changing by a large amount now. And in a way, that's one way in which VSL theories and inflation could be very different. There could be residual effects. 
nowadays. But you have to make sure the residual effects, you know, things like a part in 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 18, because otherwise you would really, you know, you'd basically contradict observations. And there's the, the only sin in science is to contradict observations. You can do whatever you want. Don't contradict observations, please. That's the only thing you're not allowed to do. Other than that, do whatever you want. So that is more or less what the theory of inflation tells you, actually. Yeah. So it's not that you're connected to the Chinese person, but if you go back in time, they came from the same place, so that you, you both came from the similar um, trajectory of human beings developing. And so in the theory of inflation, what happens is a small piece of the universe explodes so that all of those pieces were connected way back in the past, yeah. and then they can be connected now. So that's essentially what goes on with inflation. And to be fair, any, anything which goes beyond inflation does the same. In that respect. It has to. I mean, it has it to. It has to be yeah. something like that. So you basically so you have to, to say that in the common, past that yeah. there was a connection. Yeah. So there's a causal relationship. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that I can talk to the person that these universes can talk to each other now, but they had to have come from a place where they could have talked to each other in the past. So there's a reason for them to be connected. So if it is a particle that's associated with gravity in particular, you, you can measure, it would have properties like that of gravity. In other words, it would have interactions like that of gravity. And one of the things that's special about gravity is it's a force that interacts with every single particle, because every particle has mass or energy. It's not like electric, electricity interacts with charged particles, but this interacts with every particle. So you would be able to see the relationship between its decay to say an electron and its antiparticle positron, and its decay to photons, for example, or its decay to a heavy originally electron muon and its antiparticle an antimuon. So that's one way. You could just look at the ratio of the decays. The other way is that it has a very particular property called spin tube. It has to do with sort of angular momentum, momentum in the, around a circle. And it's a very specific thing if it's associated with gravity. And, and by, if you could see the different angular distribution, how it decays around a circle, you can then measure that it's spin tube. And that would also tell you it's associated with gravity. And that's if it's associated with a graviton. If it's associated with another particle, it will be much harder to do. But if it's associated with gravity, there, there are these very specific predictions. If you can measure enough decays, that can tell you what's going on. Now you should never think in those terms. I mean, to my mind, you should never think about the immediate payoff of doing something in the abstract, because you never know, OK? You're talking about, for example, nuclear physics leading to medical things. But it also led to nuclear weapons, you know? So you just never know, and it is always beyond control. But I think the, the in a way, the bet you're making about science is a bet that it's worth it. Um, and it's worth it regardless. It's basically curiosity. So what is the spin-off about studying the Big Bang? I don't know. I mean, the spin-off there is probably something, I wouldn't even say middle, you know, short range, long range. Who knows about the time scale on which these things are going to become practical? But the point is you should never think in those terms. I mean, it's basically what makes us civilized, you know, we are curious. And civilization is curiosity, and it's basically, going and looking after things and trying to find out about things. And then, of course, we do reap the we basically, we do get the benefits eventually. But it's complete, that is basically beyond what the scientist does. It's basically like a, a political thing, a technological thing, which is beyond the hands of the so people actually since, start. Since you brought up communications as one of the applications, I mean, it should be mentioned that CERN, which is where the Large Hadron Collider is located, is where the World Wide Web was developed. And the reason the World Wide Web was developed was because scientists in different nations want to work with each other as if they were in the same room. And so Tim Berners-Lee, who was then working at CERN, developed this. So it's not, I mean, and if, you know, if, if you said, why should we develop CERN, it was not to make mobile phones in the end. You know, the reason they were doing it was to do science. But in the end, having all these scientists working together stretched technology to its limits. Um, whether that specific technology is the technology we're going to use is something totally unpredictable. Whether the discoveries will be something useful is also not determined. But it is true that, I mean, yes, there's ways in which it's very expensive, but it's also much less expensive than many of the other things that we invest in worldwide. <laughs> yes, so I'm going to start that answer, and I'm sure you'll have another <laughs> answer, too. Um, but so as far as we understand, dark matter and ordinary matter are different. One of the reasons, you might say, why do we care about ordinary matter? Well, one of the really interesting things that happens with ordinary matter, for example, in our galaxy, is that it collapses into a disk. So even though dark matter is out there in the universe, it's much more diffuse. Our ordinary matter, even though it's only one-sixth of the total matter, is much denser in the region where we live because it's all collapsed. 
instead of being in this big spherical halo that we think dark matter is in, it's in this narrow plane. And because it's in this narrow plane, all sorts of interesting, and because there are other interactions, all sorts of interesting things can happen, like stars can form, complex nuclei can form, and eventually life can form. So even though just energetically we're a small fraction, in terms of having interactions and in terms of being dense, where we live now is, is very special for ordinary matter. And so, and in terms of your question about dark matter, it would depend on whether dark matter also had interactions we don't know about. Because as I said, dark matter is much more diffuse as far as we know than ordinary matter. It could be that there's a denser portion and that's actually something I'm working on now. And if that's true, it is conceivable that there could be dark life. But life is an extremely unlikely thing. So you would need an incredible conspiracy to have it happen, but it, it's not ruled out. So I think, I don't know if you read this book by Fred Oyl called, called um, the, the Black Cloud. So the thing is that we always think life is going to be like us. Mm. And of course it doesn't need to be, right? So that question is very interesting because it could be that there is life based on those forms of energy and matter, simply completely different from anything we know. So the Black Cloud is the idea of this thing that comes from outer space and forms a disk, there you go, in the solar system. Actually, that's what I'm working on now. And it takes a long time for people to realize it's alive. It's, a, it's actually a sentient being. It's something which feels, which um, is jealous, which <laughs> feels love, hate, and so on. So it could actually happen that something like that exists. It's, of course, science fiction, right? Fredo was actually a cosmologist, as it happens, but this book is definitely, you know, science fiction. But, it's, um, but that question is essentially one about what is life? which was one of the things you discussed before. And um, they're very interesting things. We are definitely on a maximum of the probability for life, as we know it. So for example, if the constants of nature were not what they are, by a few percent, we'd not be here. On the other hand, it could be that there are other maximum you know, of different types of life, and who knows about that? So that question is very relevant, but it is science fiction, right? But, so for example, we have, there's a particle called a neutrino. Um, it's just a particle that doesn't carry electric charge. An electron, on the other hand, does carry electric charge. So an electron interacts directly with light. A neutrino doesn't interact directly with light, but it interacts with an electron. So we sort of say, when we're classifying stuff, we sort of act like it's part of the world that interacts with light. But if something didn't have charge, like literally didn't have charge, and had no interaction other than gravitational with some, anything that did carry charge, it just wouldn't interact with light. So it's sort of a defining property. How do you define a particle? It's sort of what its mass is and what its charges are and what it interacts with. So it is a defining pro If there is a dark matter particle, it would be a defining property of that particle. So actually, it's the other way around. I mean, you, you define dark matter as just anything that doesn't shine you know, in a very vague sense. And then the question is, there are too many candidates. I mean, there really are a lot of candidates. I mean, lots of things could be lots of things. Anything that fits the bill is dark matter. And we just don't know which of the candidates is the best one. So another issue is, of course, we, we, it would be great if you could detect it on Earth. And there are, there are a lot of observations, like in the bottom of mines and so on, trying to detect dark matter directly in very subtle ways, because dark matter doesn't shine, but interacts in a different way. So we could actually detect dark matter directly, not just via the properties we need to explain the large-scale structure, the big structure of the universe. So it could be that we actually Detect it directly. It should be one of the things that would finish this discussion about is it gravity, is it dark matter? Well, if we saw but, dark matter particle, game over. But let's point out that if it did, if we could detect it directly, it would mean it interacts a little bit with light. It means that it would interact a lot less than most stuff, but it would still have to have a little bit of an interaction. Yeah. So we're banking, so when we look f through these direct detection experiments, we're banking on the fact that it has a tiny interaction. And if it doesn't, we won't see it that way.